So we move on now to Celeste Simon from the Abramson Cancer Center in uh, Philadelphia. Um, Celeste has been one of the leaders in the HIF uh, regulation of uh, hypoxia responses. Um, she obtained her PhD from Rockefeller, spent a time as a postdoc with Stu Orkin at Harvard, and then moved to Chicago, which actually seems to be the, the pathway for many of the speakers in this session. And from Chicago, she moved to the Abramson Center in Philadelphia, where she now is. She's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator since, I think, uh, 94. And it's great to have her here. She's talking about HIFs, MIC, and cancer. Celeste. Well, I too would like to thank the speakers for the opportunity to participate in this terrific symposium. I'm really enjoying it. Um, and I have to apologize, my title looks scarily like cheese. So I hope you don't think you're going to hear exactly the same talk again. They are related, but I'd like to give you our perspective on crosstalk between HIF and several pathways, which include MIC, and how this can affect things like cancer metabolism, tumor cell survival. And I hope you'll take home that we found a way to maybe take this to the next step and perhaps use it for targeted treatment of MIC transformed cells. So as a way to get started, um, I think you've heard from other speakers and it's very obvious that human cancers exhibit lower concentrations of oxygen than the nearby normal unaffected tissue. And this happens for a number of reasons. First of all, Solid tumors include cells that can be rapidly proliferating. As you've heard repeatedly, they have a unique metabolism. And tumors frequently exhibit vascular insufficiency. So this results in very limited oxygen diffusion through these tumors. And I always like to show this in a slide that I took from Bob Weinberg's book, which uh, reveals a section of a fibrosarcoma where the patient had actually been administered the nitroaminosal compound EF5. This produces thiol addicts on proteins within the hypoxic cells. And the point I would like to make is that this tumor has ample numbers of blood vessels. This is evidenced by immunostaining for the endothelial cell protein CD31. And the cells adjacent to the blood vessels are reasonably well oxygenated. But not that far away, the cells are hypoxic because they're now immunoreactive for an antibody that detects those thiolated proteins. And the take-home message is that while normal tissues exhibit oxygen gradients, this is much more profound in solid tumors. So steep oxygen gradients and fluctuating oxygen availability are a hallmark of many solid tumor physiologies. And we should bear in mind that many of the O2 depleted cells are probably also becoming limited for things like growth factors and nutrients like glucose and glutamine. And so as we all know, glucose and oxygen is how cells generate intracellular ATP. And so oxygen and or nutrient deprived cells within minutes begin to conserve ATP. And this is done by pathways we've heard about. Very rapidly, the mTOR pathway is inhibited by ways we don't completely understand at this time. In the ER, the unfolded protein response is uh, engaged. But there's also a transcriptional program we've already heard about from several other speakers, which is regulated by hypoxia-inducible factors. These are members of the bhlh pass family of proteins. They're heterodimeric factors consisting of an oxygen-regulated alpha subunit and a constitutive subunit, uh, a constitutive beta subunit, which is also known as ARNT. And when stimulated by low O2, HIPs bind to hypoxia response elements within the genome to enhance the expression of literally hundreds of genes that mediate hypoxic adaptations. And they have a broad influence on cancer biology. Many steps of tumor progression, in our opinion, are likely to be modulated in some way by the stress response mediated by the hypoxia-inducible factors. And I don't need to belabor this point, you've already heard this, but the pathway is largely, not completely, but largely regulated by the simple accumulation of the alpha subunit. It's very labile in oxygen replete cells because of prolyl hydroxylations. As O2 levels decline, these hydroxylations are actually inhibited, so the alpha subunit can make it to the nucleus, form the dimer with ARNT, and stimulate all these oxygen-regulated genes. Now, there are two dioxygenases that tightly regulate HIF activity. 
One is the family of HIF-specific prole hydroxylases, and the other is an asparagine hydroxylase, also known as factor-inhibited HIF. You might imagine that these dioxygenases are solely regulated by the availability of molecular oxygen within the cell. This is the substrate, or alpha-ketoglutarate, which is the cofactor. But as you already heard this morning, it is much more complicated. We believe that PhD and FIH activity are also modulated by things like intracellular reactive oxygen species and competitive inhibitors such as fumarate and succinate. So all of these things converge on the cell to activate the HIF program, and this in turn regulates or modulates cancer cell metabolism, redox homeostasis, vascular remodeling, tumor genesis, and inflammation. And so HIF really does impact multiple steps of human cancer. The traditional view was that low O2 through the HIFs and its targets like VEGF and PDGF would have a positive role on tumor angiogenesis, but in fact, tumor cell proliferation, survival, metabolism, inflammatory cell recruitment, cell motility, invasion, and metastasis are also impacted by a variety of HIF targets. And I'd like to just take a few brief moments to talk about how we've now extended this to another important regulatory pathway in cancers, and that is so-called the stemness pathways. We have shown that HIF can regulate the pluripotency factor OC4 in certain cells. It also can regulate NOTCH. We've shown in an animal model that this actually promotes thymic lymphomagenesis. And very recently, we've extended this to another frequently dysregulated pathway in human cancer, that being Wnt beta catenin signaling. The downstream recipient of robust Wnt signaling is actually stabilized nuclear beta catenin. And in Wnt regulated or Wnt stimulated cells, beta catenin forms associations with the cofactors LEF1 or TCF to enhance Wnt target gene expression and Wnt regulated developmental processes. The HIF intervention in this particular pathway is actually quite simple. In fact, LEF and TCF themselves are HIF targets. And so we've argued that in very undifferentiated stem cells of several flavors, HIF can regulate their expression, which allows increased recruitment of beta catenin into the nucleus and increased association of this active transcription factor complex. And we've shown that this occurs in a number of embryonic stem cells, or I should say stem cells of embryos. Um, but we've extended this to one uh, rather surprising to many people, adult stem cell pool, and we're looking at other ones as well. And that's actually in the adult brain. So the brain constitutes 10% of the organism, but it's been argued that 20% of the oxygen consumed by individuals is utilized in the nervous system. So it was hard for people to swallow that parts of the brain could actually be somewhat hypoxic. But in fact, this is the argument we make over and over again. There are blood vessels present. This is a very highly cellular area, and perhaps because of their unique metabolism, there isn't as much oxygen distribution that you might like to see. Once again, we can reveal this region within the hippocampus in the dentate gyrus using these nitromidazole compounds. They co-localize with SOX2-positive neuronal stem cells. If we specifically delete HIF in this compartment, the number of stem and progenitor cells is diminished, and this coincides with a profound decrease in normal wind signaling within this region of the brain. So we can dissect out the region of the brain and show that Wnt targets are decreased in, in expression in the absence of an intact HIF program. And this can also be revealed crossing in a beta-galactosidase reporter of Wnt signaling. The number of beta-galactosidase positive cells has significantly diminished. So coming back to our thoughts about HIF and cancer uh, progression, whether or not many solid tumors or we can debate this forever, are really driven by a rare so-called cancer stem cell pathway, um, we think we can agree that things like MYC, NOTCH, and WINT will play important roles in a number of human cancers. And this crosstalk with HIF, we think, is going to be uh, important to pay attention to. And this is something we're working on in the future. But I'd like to use the remainder of my time to return to crosstalk between HIF and MYC. And this comes from our profound interest 
in dissecting distinct adaptations provided by two highly related BHLH pass hypoxia inducible factors. They are HIF1 alpha and HIF2 alpha. As you can see, they're very similar to each other. They are both substrates for both the proline hydroxylases and the asparagine hydroxylase. HIF1 is expressed in virtually all cell types. HIF2 is more restricted in some tissues that can only be found in vascular endothelial cells, but it can also be detected in components of the lung, liver, and kidney. And we have shown, um, we and others, I should say, have shown over the years that there really is a distribution of labor. It seems that many of the metabolic interventions are in the domain of HIF-1. It exclusively regulates glycolytic enzymes or pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase, whereas HIF-2 preferentially regulates erythropoietin or OCT4. But we believe that the two alpha subunits have actually evolved to balance each other because in certain key ways, they have opposite effects on important intracellular pathways. And so in cells that co-express the alpha subunits, and this will play out in a number of human malignancies, if one alpha subunit gets the upper hand, you get one biological response. However, if the other dominates, we see something different. And let me describe that to you now. So it's becoming increasingly clear that the HIF2 alpha subunit can actually accumulate at somewhat higher levels of oxygen than HIF1. And very surprisingly, HIF2 does not do the prudent thing. It doesn't try to conserve ATP by slowing anabolic metabolism or decreasing rates of proliferation. Instead, it actually promotes CMYK activity. Cells expressing HIF2-alpha have robust mTOR signaling, and it opposes the activity of P53. Now, in contrast, at very at lower levels of oxygen, when HIF1-alpha accumulates and predominates, you get the critical cell survival response, i.e. ATP conservation, and HIF-1 is doing the opposite. It's opposing CMYK. It opposes CMYK in multiple ways. I could discuss them later. It clearly opposes mTOR activity and can be seen to enhance P53 function. I should emphasize, I'm talking about cells that don't have oncogenically active MYC, which she described are cells that have superphysiologic overexpression of CMYK. This is in the situation where CMYK is expressed at relatively low levels.